You're listening to the Turn Autism Around podcast, episode number 100. Yay, we made it to episode 100, which I'm so excited about. I started the podcast back in January of 2019, so we're approaching our two-year mark. And today I have a special panel presentation. We're talking about what Turn Autism Around means, and I have on the panel Michelle C., who is a parent of a two and a half year old. I have Peter, who is a parent of an 11 year old, Julie, who is a parent of a 24 year old, as well as a behavior analyst, and Allie Patterson, who is a behavior analyst at the doctoral level. We are talking about their journeys and what turn autism around means for them. So it's a great discussion. Hope you love it. Thanks for 100 uh, episodes. Hope you've enjoyed them. And I'm looking forward to our next 100 episodes too. So let's get to this special interview with our panel presentation. Okay, I'm so excited to have my first panel on the podcast. So I'm super excited. So welcome, Michelle, Peter, Julie, and Allie. Thanks so much for your time tonight. So let's start with, um, I would just like to get, have our listeners get a glimpse of your journeys with autism, with ADA, the verbal behavior approach, and really the turn autism around approach and how, what was life like before and after you learned about it and kind of where your journey started and ended just a couple of minutes each. So let's start with Michelle. Hi. First of all, I wanted to thank you for inviting me here today. I'm very excited. Um, I have a two and a half year old daughter who is newly diagnosed uh, with uh, level one autism. And uh, we first started noticing delays uh, when she was around 18 months old. She did some toe walking. She wasn't up to par with language. Uh, She had a couple words, but they weren't reliable. And then she kind of slowly lost them. I didn't hear another word with meaning until she was 25 months old. Um, after I started Mary's course. So um, along with the language regression, uh, also she stopped looking at me and she stopped responding to her name. She uh, didn't point to things or laugh as much anymore. She didn't engage um, in the way that she used to. So it was a pretty significant regression. Uh, uh, Again, autism was not something that was on my mind right away, but uh, she did end up being diagnosed. But before I got the official diagnosis, Um, I did end up finding Mary's course online, uh, fortunately, and this was during COVID. So when we suspected that she had a problem, we did see a neurologist and he suspected autism. He gave us a preliminary diagnosis so that we could receive ABA services. And so we signed her up for everything in February. And then once March hit, everything was shut down. And that's when I started Mary's course. Uh, So Elena had very few words, uh, maybe two, and again, without meaning. And it was kind of just an echo. Uh, Fortunately, once I started implementing the strategies from Mary's course, uh, she started, the floodgates just opened. single words, starting to use two word phrases. I mean, this all occurred within a few months. Um, So her progress was just remarkable. Um, And uh, so, I mean, now she's in ballet. Uh, She goes to ABA five days a week. Uh, She used to not even be able to transition to to go through a doorway. And now she can Um, now she can walk through any door. I mean, now she can, now she goes places, but she's excited to go to new places and she's excited to meet new people. And uh, it's just really fantastic. That's awesome. And how old is she now, Michelle? She is two years, eight months. She'll be three in February. Yeah. Okay. Wow. Yeah. It it is some remarkable progress. And Michelle was uh, on a a solo podcast, episode number six. 78. Um, so maryBarbera.com forward slash 78. And I have that memorized because it was, 
even an amazing podcast for me. It wasn't really even planned to be a podcast. Michelle just started posting great stuff in our Facebook community. And I was just like, I need to talk to you going from two words to, you know, 180 words or 500 words or whatever she did um, was just like really great progress. So I sat down with her and we turned it into a podcast. So that's it, really your journey is even more elaborate than that, but that's a great start. So, so we have Michelle with a two and a half year old daughter. Now let's hear the journey of Peter, who's in Australia. And um, let me hear kind of how you fell into the autism world and um, how you got involved with ABA and the turn autism around approach. Yeah, good day. Uh, hello everyone. Uh... So my son is 11. Uh, we, when he was born, I kind of suspect uh, something was going on, but I wasn't sure uh, what it was because he wasn't, you know, bubbly. He wasn't crying. He didn't have the eye contact. So in the back of my mind, I knew there was something that was different. Uh, however, we didn't get the official diagnosis until he was three and a half. And with the official diagnosis, that's when we started our journey uh, into looking at different um, therapies. Uh, so like myself, like any other parent, I just went online, Google Autism, Google Autism Therapies. And at first we started with uh, floor time and, uh, you know, uh, we started with, uh, there was a, this lady here who did uh, uh, another therapy as well. We tried that. Uh, however, we didn't see any progress. So... I ended up, uh, you know, Googling some more and came upon Mary's course, and um, that's when um, the ABA uh, world opened up to us. Um, with her course, I started um, Googling uh, ABA courses in Australia and, and ABA therapists, and uh, we hooked on to a uh, local um, uh, ABA therapist uh, in Sydney and uh, we started therapy with her. Uh, and with that, um, you know, he, he made progress. Um, you know, we did the tabletop, we did, uh, you know, the shoebox and all that. At the time, I was working at the same time, so uh, it was difficult uh, being, uh, you know, a full-time uh, parent working as well as a child on, um, you know, newly diagnosed uh, but uh, we managed to hire, you know, in-home therapist to come to the home and provide the therapy for him. It worked for a while, but then uh, I figured, you know, to make progress, someone has to um, give up the time to, to spend uh, implement therapy full time. So I ended up giving up work and being at home uh, with him full time. So that's when uh, we made really good progress. Um, so, however, uh, you know, he, he's not conversational, but uh, he can get by with, uh, you know, his needs and wants. Uh, uh, so that's, you know, his self-help skill is really good. He cooks for himself, he dresses himself, he brushes his own teeth. Uh, so my, um, my aim for him is to, you know, be as independent as possible and to be as happy as possible. So... Uh, we're on the right path. Uh, every day is a challenge still. There's always new challenges because he is becoming more self-aware. Uh, with that, it becomes, you know, different challenges uh, in terms of growing up into his teen years. So I'm looking forward to that <laughs> going forward. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, it's a uh, it's a it's a it's a good it's a uh, it's a good journey. It's a it's a never-ending journey, and there's always something new. As uh, as Mary would attest to that. Yeah, so that's, yeah, that's definitely. My journey so far. Mm. Yeah, and I I actually met Peter in 2017 when I went to mm. Australia to speak in Melbourne, and I think a couple of the members from my community were going to Melbourne to the conference where I spoke, and so. I was then traveling to Sydney. So um, Peter came and met me for, for some tea and some chat. So um, yeah, so uh, unfortunately with the worldwide shutdown, I haven't really gone anywhere um, for a long time, like most people, but um, it's great to have a community and it. And how do you feel being like one of the few dads in our community? Because it seems like <laughs> it has a, a lot of moms, grandmoms and female yeah, therapists, yeah. not a whole lot of dads. So are you, do you feel outnumbered there? 
oh, look, you know, uh, it's, uh, it's we're, we're all parents, right? When it comes down to it, you know, we're all parents, so we all want to do the best for our kids. Uh, someone has to, uh, you know, uh, 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 make the decision to, uh, to, to be the, 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 the one leading, and it happened to be me. Uh, which is fine, you know. And uh, look, uh, whether you're a dad or you're 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 a mom or your grandparent, it's a community, and and you're always welcome. So, no, I don't feel I'm left out at all. So, I feel quite uh, blessed to be in this community. Uh, oh, with that's all the great. Others, you know, that's great. Thanks, Peter. Okay, so let's move on to Ali Patterson. First, thank you so much, Mary, for having me on again. It's good to talk to you. Yeah, and Allie, you were on podcast. I don't have your number memorized, but um, you, you can find Allie Patterson's um, full podcast in the show notes. We'll put it in the show notes. But um, yeah, quickly tell our, our listeners about yourself in a shortened version. That would be awesome. Yeah. Um, so I think like a lot of behavior analysts, I did not have a, a straight path exactly to ABA. So I was actually training to become a researcher in developmental psychology. Um, and I love many aspects of developmental psychology. I'm glad that I had that background. Um, but I was exposed to some ideas about intervention that just didn't really make sense or that weren't necessarily effective. Um, but I was always really drawn to the philosophy of behaviorism since I was an undergrad. Um, so then when I was working on my PhD, I needed a summer job and I was already curious about ABA. So I started working with this little boy who has autism. Um, so I was working as his behavior technician under a BCBA. Um, and I just, I loved that kid so much and he made such great progress. Um, and so I'm not, a, I'm not a parent like you guys, but I do feel like my, my path to ABA started with just how, how much I love being with this little guy. Um, and also seeing how effective these strategies were for him. So, um, I kind of changed my whole life plan to, to focus less on developmental research and more on intervention, um, so I became a BCBA and then I did my dissertation on an ABA topic. Um, and then when I was, after I graduated, I was working for a couple different organizations. Um, but I never really found the one that, that was right in line with, with my values. So I decided to go solo. Um, and so now I'm working for myself, mostly consulting with parents, but also managing a few more comprehensive ABA programs. Um, and I really found, um, Mary's courses as COVID was happening, as the shutdown happened, we had to, to transition to, to telehealth for a lot of my kids. Um, and there was this one little guy in particular who, I mean, he just, he didn't have any language. He was uh, banging his head on the wall. They, were, they couldn't get him to sit down and eat. Um, it was just really rough for these, for this family. And I was, you know, so worried that I, I thought COVID was going to be uh, kind of it because he was too, you know, it was prime time for intervention. I wanted to really get in there during this, this critical period for him. Um, so I decided to take Mary's course thinking she, she has really good tips in her book for how to communicate with parents. So that's why I signed up for the course. And um, I use a, a lot of her programs, but, but more than that, I use her language, the way that Mary explains uh, the concepts to parents has made so much sense, not only to me, but, but to these, these people. And um, the kid that I mentioned, he's doing so great now. I was like, we started in April and he's got, he had no words, lots of problem behaviors. He's got 200 words now. He speaks in short sentences. Um, he plays with his toys. Like he, the, the kid does not stop talking these days. So um, I'm just, I'm really grateful and, and, and happy for the work that you are doing, Mary. Well, that's awesome. It's, it's great to, to see when I started these courses and I started back in March of 2015 with my first online course, you know, I knew the techniques worked that I implemented with, with the children that I saw my clients. I wasn't a hundred percent sure it was going to work with people that I didn't ever meet. I never looked at any videos, never gave them any feedback, but you know, to see the gains that Michelle's daughter made and Peter's son made and the, the gains that you're making as a BCBA, as a BCBA D, which means you have a doctorate too. Um, you know, you think like, well, what could this little online course really provide? But it's great to hear that it is definitely a big tool in your tool toolbox now. And I think 
with the publication of my book in March. Um, it's just going to really get this, this approach out to many, many more people, which is exciting. So great. So last but not least, my, the person I've known the absolute longest uh, out of the panel is my good friend, Julie T. So Julie, you want to tell us about your background? Right. So my child, who's now an adult, and is about the same age as Mary's son. So, so, Mar- so Mary and I met quite uh, as our children were maybe in elementary school. Um, so, but I would start talking about how I got into the ABA uh, world was that I, I, before I had children, I was, had a master's degree in psychology and I was actually working on a PhD in community psychology, but I kind of, it wasn't, it just wasn't quite right for me. It wasn't the right fit for me. And then after having my second child was born and she had a visual impairment and, but still I, I, even, even with the visual impairment, it just, there seemed to be some other things that weren't quite right. You know, like when she would, we'd be at the bus stop and she'd just take off running and not look back or um, just sitting in the corner, turning the pages, looking at books over and over again. I was just like, this isn't quite right. And I kept asking people, what's going on here? What's going on? And, you know, it took a long time to get an answer um, until almost four, when a lot, some of the visual impairment, another mom said, you know, did you ever look at, at P, what was then called P, PDD? So, and then we went back to the developmental pediatrician who several years before said, absolutely, there was not autism there. Um, because there was a point, because uh, <laughs> she was pointing. Um, but I had taught her to point, because I was, you know. So anyway, so then I got quickly, I, I found some ABA parents who kind of steered me towards getting a private consultant and getting um, ABA therapy going. And at that time, so we had a 40 hour a week program, which I think is similar to what Mary had with Lucas um, and worked really, really hard for a whole bunch of years in getting language going. So some of the things that were involved in that program where we had to have, I remember they told us before they started, we had, I had to get 400 pictures of like 20 different items, 20 different uh, categories. You know, each, each of them had 20 items in them and pictures matching objects. And so I had to have objects and all those pictures and it was really overwhelming. And so the kinds of things that I had to do in that kind of program were really, it was a really a lot of work and very intense and not something that everybody would, would really be able to do. Um, so that was just, those are just some of the thoughts that I had about that at the time. I mean, later, Mary, Mary was my mentor and I got my BCBA and Mary said to me, yes, you can do this, Julie, you can do that, this, you should do this. Um, because I really hadn't considered doing it until that time. Um, and so some of the, obviously Mary's techniques weren't used on my child because, <laughs> because, um, we were, we were past that point at the, when, when Mary developed them. Um, but Mary and I were sort of in contact working together during the whole time that she developed them. And we have a strong, strong agreement about some of the, 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 approaches that are used in terms of being very, very positive, that we don't want the child to be crying. If the child's crying, something's wrong. Um, And some of those things are not how ABA was traditionally done. And Mary has a a very, a a unique approach in that it's very, very positive, um, which I really strongly, strongly agree with. Um, So those are, those are a couple more thoughts. Um, So my, uh, Child now is an adult, age 24, uh, graduated college this year, and then, of course, got launched into COVID. So <laughs> there's not, um, but is living semi independently. I mean, I don't sleep, we don't sleep in the same house. Um, you know, I come every day and we, we um, you know, learn cooking and cleaning and, you know, all the things that you have to learn to be an adult. We did have because we were working so hard on the academics, we didn't always, we didn't have the time to do all of the things. So we didn't work as much on some of the self-help things like cooking at a younger age. And now we're catching up, catching up and doing that now. And I think that's one piece of, of advice I'd give people like, don't worry, you can't do all the stuff. Um, and you, it, it, maybe it's going to take a few extra years to finish teaching some of the, some of the skills. And that's really okay. 
you know, that's all right. You're, you're not going to be able to, you can't fit it all in there because the, the demands are so much to, of all the things you have to teach. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, when you were saying about how you had to gather all these materials and stuff, it, it, it triggered me to, to remember, like, we used to bring in a consultant and she'd only come like once a month. And yeah, on the whole day, and we pay her some like thousand dollars or you know eight hundred. I mean, it was a lot of money, um, for her to tell us what to do. And then my husband would be like, "Okay, she leaves. We pay her all that money, and then you have like fifteen hours of work to do." <laughs> it's like, yeah, that is kind of strange. And then you know, you come to realize, like, oh my god, this is frightening. Like nobody really knows what they're doing. I mean. The consultant did. She was good. But once she moved down south, I got a different consultant. Then I was just like, oh, my God, this is frightening. And that's when I became interested in becoming a behavior analyst. And I would recruit other gung-ho moms um, and dads to pursue it. Because at the time, you know, you needed a master's degree in something and then add the ABA certification. And we kind of specialized in that. Julie and I worked together closely in the Pennsylvania Verbal Behavior Project, which is now called the Patent Autism ABA Supports Initiative. And um, I think there was a time when a third of our consultants were parents of kids with autism. So um, Julie was one of the subjects in my qualitative research study, which is called the experiences of autism mothers who become behavior analysts. Um, because what we've seen, and we can link that in the show notes, but what we've seen, and we've seen it on my podcast episode so far, is it's very common for parents to become behavior analysts, for them to become advocates, um, and all kinds of things, because it really does change your life um, and change your worldview. So I think it, it's very common for parents to pursue other um, professional roles. Um, and we can, maybe we'll have you back, Julie, with other BCBA parents um, to talk about some of the overlap, because that's like a whole nother topic. Um, but you also have a lot of experience with early, yeah. early intervention. And also, I, I think because your daughter was so high functioning, getting into college, graduating from college, um, you also really had a unique uh, way of looking at, like, I remember you telling me, which Lucas is, you know, at the opposite end of the spectrum, in terms of language, um, and and you were you were teaching her like pop stars and and oh, you yeah. know, all kinds of tax for what's kind of in style with with girls that were twelve or fourteen or whatever and and you you were very much on the cutting edge of like there's so much that there's we have language to that has to be taught yeah there was so much that had to be taught. And still we, we, and I still have spent many, many hours creating new programs um, from that time around age 11 or 12, social skills programs, theater programs. I mean, I, we, I can't even tell you how many, new, how many programs I've initiated and collaborated and sort of spun off um, because we needed, we needed more, more, more things. We, we needed more. Um, and it wasn't, and a lot of the, the programs are ABA in, in not, not in the sense of, of table work ABA, but in terms of, in more of the VB sense of looking at motivation, looking at what's going to motivate the kids. So when we do a social skills group or a theater program, those kids or the young people want to be there. They're excited to be there because we're using their favorite stuff. We're using their car favorite cartoon characters and their favorite video games. And we're using all their favorite stuff to get them to learn perspective taking and to learn to how to perform on a stage or even on a Zoom play. We, you know, we, and, and they're excited and they're motivated and they want to be there. So that's just, that's a whole nother, nother piece. Yeah. It's very complicated and um, needs to be individualized. But at the same time, it can be pretty simple. And I think that's what I'm trying to do is make it as simple as possible. And then, especially for 
professionals and parents who really get into it, into um, providing individualization is taking it to the next level, but never forgetting the base of it's got to be child friendly. It's got to be positive. It's got to be motivating. It's got to be as stress free as possible for both the child and the family. Otherwise it's not going to be maintained. Um, Okay. So why don't we talk about what turning autism around means? Um, Turn autism around is the name of my podcast. This is episode 100, which is a huge marker. Um, Turn autism around is also the name of my new book. And my new book is focusing on Uh, helping parents, and it's an action guide for parents of children one to five years of age with signs of autism with or without a diagnosis. However, since there's chapters on talking, tantrums, sleeping, eating, potty training, desensitization, it's going to help kids like Peter's son, um, potentially, you know, there's going to be things in there. But when you try to go real general, Um, I really want to get to the little kids who don't even have a diagnosis yet, because I feel like those are the people that are really waiting in line and without anything. And the more we can simplify things at the two-year-old mark or the three-year-old mark, the better these kids are going to do down the road. But no matter where you're at, parent or professional, what does turning autism around mean to you? So Michelle, why don't we circle back to you? Yeah. So Turning autism around to me, now that I've taken your course, I've taken uh, all three of your courses, actually, for parents. So um, I I believe turning autism around means helping children with delays reach their highest potential, whatever that means for for that child. I had no idea that Maya Elena could reach the potential that she has, even now. She's not even three years old. Um, And she's nearly conversational, not quite yet, uh, but nearly there. Um, So reaching your highest potential is, I think, what turning autism around means. And that's truly what my experience has been after taking your courses. Okay, great. So, Peter, what does turn autism around mean for you? Um, Turning autism around for me is... Uh, hope, I think. Um, it means that uh, as a parent, um, there there are tools and techniques out there that you can help, uh, and it gives the parent confidence going forward uh, that you can impact uh, the little child's life in, in either way, uh, whether you decide to be, you know, um, a full-time parent like myself or... Uh, Involving uh, your, your 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 child's therapy or intervention in either way, it also helps um, knowing what questions to ask as well. Uh, if you you know have uh, therapists that uh, help well, you know come to the house and help, you know they can help you. Um, yeah, know what questions to ask and 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 and, um, and uh, be involved in, in the intervention. Um, for me, for my child, it's more about, uh, you know, letting him live a happy and full life, whatever that might be. Uh, you know, he's not yet compensational, but if it means that if he could, you know, cook his own food, go do his own shopping, uh, be as independent as possible, I think that that's still um, um, uh, a great achievement. Uh So, yeah, it's about hope, I think. Hope uh, in that, uh, you know, the child can live their fullest life uh, to the most potential. I think that's what it means to me. Yeah. That's great. That's great. Okay, Ali, what does turn autism around mean for you? Yeah, I think uh, for the professionals, um, the the way that we've got to turn autism around is what Mary's all about, which is the parents have to be involved. I mean, we need to get parents Mm. being the driving force, the, the best advocates for their kids. Um, we need them out there advocating for treatments that are evidence-based, but that also work for their lifestyle. Um, and they know best what works for their lifestyle. So I, I've always had the best outcomes um, for kids with the most involved families. And actually I had a parent tell me, a grandparent actually, she told me um, 
kind of early on, she was like, this isn't just like a therapy. AB is a, it's a lifestyle. Yeah, <laughs> like, yes. It's, it's a lifestyle. <laughs> it's every day. You live it every yeah. day. I thought she, she really nailed it, you know, and that's, I found that's true for the kids that I've seen make the most progress. Their, their families kind of adopt it as a lifestyle, but I, I don't want to to scare anybody listening off like that. It's, you know, you have to change your whole life because it can be a really gradual and fun process that your kid can love a lot. Mm-hmm. And, and for these kids, I think the main thing that I would want to turn around for them um, is giving them the chance to to fully participate in their relationships. Cause I think relationships are the, the best part of life. And there's, you know, that it's just a really sad myth that kids with autism don't want to have social relationships, but, but of course they do, you know, everybody does, we all do. Um, so I just, I want to teach them the skills that help them participate, like asking for what they need, expressing how they feel. And beyond that, I think there's also, there's a piece for everybody, not just parents or professionals about, acceptance you know we can teach other people how to include our kids and and how to stand up for them when they need help yeah I think that's great um I do really want to empower the parent and I think that is the best thing professionals can do is empower the parent to become the quote-unquote captain of the ship and to you know when I hear about professionals who are like no you can't come in to see the speech therapy session we that's our policy we bring the two-year-old back themselves and they're even if they're screaming we know best you sit in the waiting room it's like that's not really going to help that's not going to help the parent that's not going to help the child that's not going to help the parent professional relationship um, or the child parent relationship or to help pair the new therapist and so you know if any of that is going on in your world i think you need to to really look at it and um, have professionals attend a free workshop that i do or listen to this podcast because it doesn't have to be that way. And the more empowered the parents get, I think the better. So I love that. So thank you. Okay, Julie, what does turn autism around mean for you? Well, I agree with a lot of what everyone else said. So, so I, instead of repeating that, I'll say a, a different, you know, something else that I was thinking as they're talking, which was that when a lot of people told me that ABA was a bad thing because it was going to sort of turn my child into this sort of rigid robotic uh, non-person. And for me, turning that around is is that having your child grow up and really be themselves. If they want to have purple hair, they can have purple hair. If they, they can make their own choices. If they, you know, and a lot of the kids that I know that I've known since they were really young, some of them are gay, some of them are trans, some of them are, they, they have their own relationships, some of them drive, some of them are working, some of them are not working. I um, mean, but they have their own, they have their own lives and they're able to make their own choices. And that's huge. And I, I also, I also put it, I, I have just a thing I say to myself is like, then, then if we if we teach them these skills, then they're going to be able to go to Disney World, not the act just the actual Disney World, but they're going to be able to experience all the fun stuff and get all the reinforcement, as opposed to being cut off from it. You know, so if a child is banging their head and they're not toilet trained, we can't take them to Disney World. Yeah, right. So you're not just talking about Disney World on their own, but you know, and I do say that, you know, if, if they can't request their wants and needs some way, either vocally or with a device or with a system, um, if their major problem behaviors aren't near zero, if they're not toilet trained and working, you know, at least on a schedule, it's going to be really hard to take them on a plane or take the child to, or even the adult to restaurants and those sorts of things. So, yeah. I, I mean, I know there are people in our community that don't agree with ABA. And when we, us three behavior analysts on this, on this panel, um, we know that the science of ABA, there's nothing to disagree with. It's, it should be, you reinforce the behavior, it's going to go up. Now, whether I reinforce it or the environment re- reinforces it, The principles of ABA are surrounding us all the time. So whether you believe in it or not, 
um, it's happening. And we just want to make it where it's positive so that each child can reach his or her fullest potential. So we're not trying to make uh, them form. We're, we're trying to get them to have what they want. Right. And we're not trying to change their personalities. Yeah. We're trying to get them to be as safe as possible, as independent as possible, and as happy as possible. And we want the families to be happy too, because, yeah. you know, Ju- Julie and I know, you know, for years we were making those 200 flashcards or whatever we needed to do. But, you know, we also have one life, so we don't want to be like fully entrenched. I mean, we all are entrenched to some degree in the autism world, but we want to also reach, reach our potentials. Go ahead, Peter. You want to say something? Can I just say something? ABA it changes as your child grows. It's not just tabletop, tabletop. It's adaptable as well. You know, uh, with myself being, uh, having an 11 year old son who's changing, whose needs are changing. So that ABA has to change with him. Uh, so now, you know, we use uh, reinforcements like uh, bicycle riding, uh, go on trains, uh, uh, and use that as a language uh, to develop his language as well. Uh, going shopping, asking for his favorite uh, chocolate treats, or asking for his favorite ice cream. So it's not as rigid as people think. It, it, it develops as a child develops. Uh, it changes as a child changes. So uh, it's very adaptable, and I find that, uh, like Mary has said, it's uh, it, we use it every day, even if you're non-autistic. It's uh, about, about reinforcing. It's about uh, positive behavior. Uh, it's about rewarding as well. So uh, I totally uh, agree with what Mary is saying. Right, and yeah, any like situation it. can be assessed, broken down. Yeah. Like Lucas, for instance, a couple of weeks ago, he was exposed to COVID. He needed a COVID test. A couple of months ago, he had to start wearing a mask. Um, mm. You know, these his his day program where he was doing pre-vocational work closed down. You know, all of these changes, like you're saying, Peter, you know, we need to change with him. So, you know, mm. a COVID test, how's that going to go? Since I had already experienced a COVID test, I knew kind of what it was like. Um, I knew that we would have to have what we call a promise reinforcer, which is a reinforcer after the procedure, you know, a strong promise reinforcer. I knew that because of haircuts and desensitization towards Mm. other procedures, that counting would work well. I knew that somebody else watching the test, having a model, of someone else getting the test before him would work. And so all of these ideas, we put it together, we planned it. I wasn't even there and he got the test and, and did well. Um, So whatever level your child or adults child or clients are at um, planning reinforcement, breaking steps down to get the child um, through whatever difficulty is is what we're all about. So I I love all of your responses for what turn autism around means. Um, I don't think there's, you know, some people have kind of a knee jerk reaction to turn autism around. Well, we we're talking about recovery. You're talking about you know, not everybody gets all better. And of course, my, my son is needs twenty four seven care. And there's a whole gamut and you know, Michelle, you certainly don't know what your daughter's going to be like as she gets older. Um, Even Peter, you know, being your son is at 11, you don't know exactly how things are going to turn out. But what you do know is you have knowledge, you have resources, so that whatever you confront and, 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 and your, your name, I like to say this too, your name's not out of the lottery for more stuff to come out, <laughs> um, no, for your yeah. name to be called for more stuff. And, you no, know, always more stuff. and just because we have autism doesn't mean there's not going to be cancer and death of a loved one and all the other stuff that can certainly str- add stress. Um, and so, but I think, what I'm teaching and what I'm trying to do in my life is to try to be as resilient as possible and live my happiest life and my purpose driven life too. And I think all of you here 
are also trying to do that. I mean, we're all just trying to live our best lives, right? So speaking of best lives, part of my podcast goals are for parents and professionals and people with autism to be uh, less stressed and lead happier lives. So um, what are your self-care tips or stress management techniques can be anything. Um, Why don't we just go in the same order? So Michelle, let's start with you. Sure. And I said this in the last podcast that I participated in with you, but Um, but sleep is, I think just very important. It's very easy as a, as a parent of a a child on the spectrum to stay up all night and worry about any little thing, but just allow yourself to sleep. Um, you, you're not helping your child or yourself if you're sleep deprived. It's just, uh, I can't recommend it enough. (laughs) Very simple. Um, (laughs) um, also just remember that, you know, your child best, um, Mary told me this uh, in several instances uh, through threads on her Facebook page. I had questions about some things that my ABA clinic was doing. And uh, it was it was recommended to me to just remember that I know her best um, and make sure that you tell your child's therapist exactly what you want their programming to look like based on how well you know your own child. Uh, I think it's really easy for a parent who's new to autism to be kind of bulldozed into thinking that a certain way of therapy is correct. Uh, But fortunately, I took most of Mary's course before I put my daughter in actual in-clinic ABA therapy, and I was able to really be an advocate for her because of that. How do you respond, um, Michelle, to parents who say, I just want to leave it all to the therapist. I just want to be the parent. I just want to have fun, normal life, normal things. And I just want to leave everything to the professional. Um, I would say to them, you can still have your fun, normal life with all of the fun things involved, but uh, you also um, need to understand that it is your responsibility as a parent to make sure that you are engaging your child for as much of the day as possible. Um, and you know where your child's strengths and weaknesses are, your child isn't in ABA all day. I mean, that's like saying, I don't wanna teach my child anything because they go to school to learn things. You know, you're still responsible for teaching them. So I would say that both are needed. (laughs) Yeah, I agree, I agree. And part, I mean, your your role as a parent, especially with a young child, yeah. is to teach them, to teach them to, you know, eat different foods, to talk, you know, most kids don't need intensive teaching to learn to talk, but some kids do. And um, you can get the most bang for your buck if you learn the techniques. So you become the captain of the ship and then get therapists and babysitters and everybody that's going to kind of be on the same page. I think that's really important. So I love it. And I love sleep too. People say, Oh gosh, you get so much done. Do you ever sleep? I sleep eight hours a night. At least I'm a huge fan of sleep as well. So thank you for that. Okay. Peter, uh, what are your stress reduction tips for us? Oh, uh, my stress reduction tips is, uh, it's not perfect. Okay. So don't try to make everything perfect. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to live with that, uh, you know, there will always be issues, uh, there will always be challenges, and uh, and it's not, then it doesn't always work out the way you plan, but in the end, if you're on the right path, uh, um, that, 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 that's wonderful to, uh, how can I say it, uh, because there, there, was, there are always new challenges, you won't completely cure autism it, you have to learn to live with it and there's always some uh yeah new <laughs> new challenges so my, my stress is don't stress it it, it it is what it is just go with the flow uh you know you have the the knowledge and the techniques and and the the, the information there and just just use it uh, as best as you can uh and and just to to know that what you're doing uh is 
you, you do it with good intentions and um uh, yeah it, it, it's I'm telling myself that as well uh not to stress not to you know make everything perfect and you can never never be perfect uh, yeah. as long as the child is happy and content and and um live a wonderful and, and fulfilling life I think that's that's what you can hope for um, yeah just put one foot yeah. in front of the other one I've... foot in front of the other yeah. yeah, I've never been a perfectionist and I actually yeah. am really grateful for that because I think if I were a perfectionist, yeah. um, you know, I would have a lot more stress. Yeah. Um, I remember being on a, on a phone call when Lucas was diagnosed and he was like literally taking, you know, a bottle of water he'd find on the coffee table and he would just dump it or yeah. soda or whatever. Um, meanwhile, I'm on the phone with my friend who has two little typical girls and they're, she's screaming at them. You're going to get time out for going up the steps with muddy shoes. And I'm like, <laughs> Okay, Lucas just dumped a soda on the family room <laughs> sofa. And like, yeah. you know what? If I if I were that high strung, I would I would be like a mess because, you know, when Lucas was little, he'd get a hold of markers and stuff. And it's like, you know, we yeah. just needed kind of to move forward. Okay, now we're not going to have markers laying out. Now we're not going to leave open cans of soda on the coffee table and just kind of move forward so that the next day we don't repeat the same problems over and over again. But yeah, there's always going to be new challenges. I love that, Peter. And uh, just, you know, better done than perfect for sure. Yeah. And, okay. Um, yeah. Okay, Allie. We have some good days and we have some bad days. So. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> Allie, what are your stress reduction or self-care tips? Yeah, I think for the parents and the professionals, we've got to lean on our communities. I think the, the people I've met in the autism world are some of the most kind and, and helpful people. Um, I think we, we really are just a group who likes to help. Um, and there's, you know, your local communities, and then there's also tons of stuff on Facebook, and Mary's groups are wonderful. Um and I think, you know, this is, this is the reason why we're always emphasizing these social skills with our kids is because we know when, when times are tough, we need people to lean on. So, so lean on your, your people. Um, and, and also look at, look at your progress. I mean, look at how far you've come when, when I'm yeah, that's feeling, true. yeah, when I'm feeling like I'm stuck with somebody or not getting anywhere. Um, I like to go back and look and look at where we, where we started and see what, what we've accomplished. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, I love that. And um, love that, yeah. part of my courses is, is as you guys know, but, you know, to, to start out with a baseline language sample and two baseline videos. Um, I know that for Michelle, that was really super important because we're actually writing up her daughter's progress because it was so amazing and, and trying to get it published in a, as a case study. But, you know, looking at, oh, wow, we started with two words and now we're up to you know, in her case, it was hundreds of words. But even if you start with two words or zero words, and you get 10 words, you know, it's progress. And I think the more you can measure that more you have before and after or monthly videos or monthly language samples or weekly language samples, you can see progress. And I think that's highly motivating for the parent and the professional. <laughs> yeah. Okay, Julie. Um, I guess I would say, look, look for your fellow travelers, find, there's going to be a lot of people that you meet along the way. And it's sort of what Ali said, but a little bit more is that you may lose some people, because you don't really have as much in common with them. And if you over the over the years where your child grows, you may not meet the same friends that like some of the people who have typical kids, you may not have as much in common with because you're, maybe your child isn't participating in football or cheerleading or whatever, you know, whatever the, the, the activities are. And you may develop, but, but you might want to look for developing a whole new set of people, you know. And so over the years, I've developed that I have so many people that have I've known for the last 25 years who've been on the journey with me. So they're kind of like fellow, tra fellow travelers. And Sometimes at certain points, you need people who seem to be closely aligned in their journey. You know, so you find parents of kids who are functioning similarly pairing up. But sometimes that doesn't matter anymore. 
because sometimes you're all part of one big family. And sometimes you have a lot in common with more in common with somebody whose kids somewhat different than yours. So, and, and how things turn out in the long run is different anyway, as, as we all know. So I just feel like I'm really glad that I made all the relationships that I've made um, because, you know, and then when it came down to COVID and we didn't, we couldn't have a graduation party, everybody got together and made a big drive by, you know, and, 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 and we have that memory. We have yeah, we that drive by instead of the, the graduation from college that I've been working for, <laughs> that we've all been working for, for so many years. Yeah. Yeah. And I think the whole world is on zoom now, but you know, I've been on zoom since the very beginning of it. And it's, it's amazing how, you know, like I did, meet Julie many times in person. And I met Peter once in person in Sydney, but, you know, Michelle and Allie, I've never met you in person, but I still feel really close with you because we've, I've interviewed you. We we've talked and it's amazing how close communities can get, you know, back when, when Julie's daughter and Lucas were diagnosed, you know, there was no Facebook, there was no social media, there was just the beginning of AOL email. And, and um, it's amazing how there are definitely some issues with social media and issues with Facebook and that sort of thing. But you can really find, um, you can find your tribe, you can find other people in very similar situations. And, and I want to thank you guys for coming on tonight, helping me with, um, you know, uh, an episode, hopefully it's going to be helpful to people. I think it, it really shows some diversity with a very young child an 11 year old, 24 year old parent, professional professionals, you know, empowering parents. And I think, the more we as a field move forward in this approach, I think the happier we'll all be. So thank you so much for your time tonight in um, coming together to talk about turning autism around. And I'm so excited for 2021 with uh, my book coming out. I think the word is going to spread more and more. So thank you for listening. Thank you for being here and telling your stories.